Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. We're um, going to get started in uh, just two minutes. Um, my name is Sean Young. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Costcraft, and I'm here with Dr. Terry Scott, who I will introduce in just a minute. Um, we're going to get started in 120 seconds. So um, thank you for joining us, and just hold that. Hi everyone, if uh, you've just joined us, um, we're gonna get started in uh, just a couple of minutes. Um, still got people uh, trickling in, but uh, we will get started promptly. All right, let's get started. So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Sean Young. I am the CEO and co-founder of Classcraft. Um, this is the um, second event in our chat with the experts series uh, that we're doing throughout the month of August, um, where our goal is to um, you know, have honest, open conversations with education researchers that are you know, at the forefront of um, super interesting cutting edge research that uh, we all care about. And um, the intention here is to uh, have this be informal. It's really hard often for educators to have access to, you know, research and research findings in a way that is, you know, digestible and, um, you know, easy to understand and doesn't require uh, tons and tons of readings. So um, this our little effort here to, you know, get get the uh, get the lowdown straight from the people working in the field and um, do that in a way that is, you know, as as easily accessible as possible for teachers that are super busy. So whether you're tuning in on the video version or on the audio version, um, you know, sit back and um, please enjoy this time and this conversation uh, with my guest here today, Dr. Terry Scott. So welcome, Terry. Really happy to have you here today. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, so just before we get started, I'll uh, let you all know who Terry is. Um, so Terry Scott is a professor and distinguished uh, university scholar in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Louisville. He began his career as a counselor in residential treatment and has worked with students with challenging behaviors across a variety of settings, including all levels of public school. Having received his PhD in special education at the University of Oregon in 1994, with an emphasis on emotional and behavioral disorders, so SEL before it was trendy, uh, Dr. Scott has uh, over 100 publications, including five books on a variety of issues in the areas of behavioral disorders and behavioral support systems. He's a frequent speaker, having conducted well over a thousand presentations. That's just a huge number, Terry, uh, and training activities and has been an invited speaker throughout the U.S. and around the world. As a former two-term editor of Beyond Behavior, he is also the recipient of national awards for research and leadership in the area of behavioral disorders with grant funding of over $26 million. His research interests focus on school-wide prevention systems, the role of instructional variables in managing student behavior, functional behavior assessment and intervention, and scientific research and education. So um, that's quite the pedigree, Terry. Um, so like I said, thank you for being here. Thank you for, for giving us this time. And, and more importantly, thank you for working on these topics for such a long time. Um, it's a important work. Yep, you just get old and then your your record of things you've done looks long. And that's kind of another way of saying you're old, I think. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, every time I chat with you, I don't feel like you're have an old <laughs> mindset anyways. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's important. Um, so we're going to get into the research in, in just a second and, you know, dive into that. But, you know, part of our effort of making this more personable um, is just getting to know the people behind the research as well. So here's my icebreaker question for you. Um, what is your hobby? 
<clears throat> um, on a daily basis, I ride my bicycle and that's um, the thing I think that keeps me sane most. Um, I've been collecting vinyl records since I was a little kid and have several thousand of them now that I have to keep in my house and drive my wife nuts with. Um, <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, those are the two things that I think I consider my hobbies. Do you have any recent finds that you were like, oh my God, I've been looking for this one for so many years? Actually, no, it's really hard to find things that I'm looking for anymore. I've kind of already found them all. So it's mm. more like um, discovering new things now more than than old things. Are you adding new stuff? Like a lot of bands are like coming back to vinyl now. Um, it's really expensive. I rarely buy that brand new vinyl. It's like $40, $50. So yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the thrift stores for all my stuff. Nice, nice. That's such an interesting, uh, interesting hobby. Um, well, I'm, and I'm glad uh, biking is keeping you sane. Uh, I'm a jogger myself, but I have a lot of respect for cyclists. <laughs> um, so, you know, how did you get started in education research? You know, we, we, we rattled off here, you know, um, the long pedigree, but you've been at this for a while. How did, how did you end up there? Um, <clears throat> not by any planning. Um, my family are all educators, and um, I really was interested in psychology uh, and got my undergraduate degree in psychology, but there's not, not a lot you can do with that degree. I ended up working in residential treatment in Portland, uh, Oregon, and um, spent five years working with adjudicated adolescent boys in a more or less lockdown setting. And um, either I'm good at it or I just got proficient after doing it for five years and I really liked that group of kids. Mm. <clears throat> to move forward in my career, I really needed to do something else and I got a degree in special ed which allowed me to be a teacher and I taught in a again similar facility um and again it's kind of like I never thought well I'll do this and then I'll do this and then I'll do this it just kind of things came together where I uh, got really interested in research and so I went back to the University of Oregon where I'd gotten my undergrad and uh just looked up faculty there and met this guy George Sagai who mm. uh talked me into coming there and I ended up working with George for a few years and then went back into teaching actually because I was interested in applying some of the things I learned and then ended up um after that um going into higher ed where I've been for over 25 years about 25 26 years I guess mm. so what, what was it about that that group of students originally or that group of young people that really <clears throat> drew you in? That's a, a great question. I find them funny. I enjoyed being. Ah, I, yeah, it's, I agree. <laughs> it's never a dull moment. I, uh, the things that would bother other people, I laughed at. I just thought these kids are, are a hoot. Um, but maybe that's part of what worked for me is that I didn't get really mad at them. I, I mean, I had expectations, et cetera, but um, I think they knew I enjoyed being there and maybe that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more easily for me than for others. I don't know. I can I, so relate to that. Uh, and that's that's kind of how I ended up in teaching. I just did a substitute teaching job and then like, I like these kids. They're, you know, they think they're so cool, but they're really just dorks <laughs> trying to figure it out, you know. And uh, kids are just kids. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that really resonates with me. Um, you know, kids can tell, you know, the, at the end of the day, you know, and we'll get into your research here in a bit, but like, it's, it's all about the relationship building, right? It's, you know, when you're saying they, they could tell that you like being in there really in essence, that is a huge facilitator for you to have a healthy relationship with them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, I go into schools frequently still and work. And um, <clears throat> you can find plenty of challenges without being in the room filled with kids with behavior challenges. Um, but I find myself far more comfortable 
when I'm in that setting. Um, and most of those kids now are in the gen ed setting anyway, mm-hmm. when, when I was a teacher. Um, but it just, like I said, never a dull moment. There's always something to keep you interested. Keep you on your toes, right? <laughs> sure. Um, you know, and, and that brought you into, you know, doing a lot of research. I mean, it's so interesting because your, your story here about how you got into it and, you know, um, and you said it yourself here, you know, maybe I had a knack for it. I don't know, but, um, that's what you ended up researching for a long time. Like what, what makes good teaching? And, you know, I think your words are effective instruction. Um, but, but in essence, you know, I, I feel like you've, you went from there and then went into 20 years of trying to figure out, you know, what what was going on there that I could understand and transfer to other teachers. Yeah, and it's, you know, that's been a path too. And I'm at a point in my career where I can do what I want, which is, you know, a good, a great. Everybody person. heard that, Terry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I was young in the field, it was, I had to follow a line of research that was going to go somewhere and that was going to get publications, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, And I still want those things. Um, But I had to be really thoughtful of that. Um, As I progressed through that research and, um, you know, most of it on school-wide things and functional behavior assessment, et cetera, I always had this sparkle in my mind that there's more to this than what we're capturing. Um, and that has continued to make me take the next step. And like I said, I'm, I'm at this point now where, um, I have enough things going on that I have the luxury of doing some really exploratory kinds of studies where there isn't any money for it right now. Um, but maybe there will be if we can find some things. And so I, I think that's kind of the way higher ed is is you you go where you can get money and publications otherwise you're not going to have a job Mm -hmm. you know after 25 years i i have some ability now to to do things that i otherwise couldn't have done and and so i'm trying to take advantage of that Mm. so i i want to hear you on that um you know i think that the you know, we, we, we talked before this and, um, you know, I think it'd be useful for people to just know what the foundation for, for your work right now is. So tell us a little bit about, you know, this effective instruction models you've developed and the, and the research that went into that. Um, and then we could talk about, you know, the, the really cutting edge stuff you're doing right now. Well, um, at the University of Oregon, I was exposed to things that I'd never been exposed to before with regard to effective instruction. And the research on it. And it really shaped the way I think about everything. So Mm. Richard Engelman was uh, the the father of direct instruction and he has built a science. We know that when you choose examples in this way and present them in this way and do these things, we can increase the probability of kids being successful and behavior is one of those successes. It's not just the academic part. And I Again, I'm I'm a full-blown disciple of that. But again, in the back of my head, there's always, I know that we can take all of those things that we know are science-based and have two teachers use the exact same lesson with similar kids, and it'll work for one and not for the other. And there's something about a personality, about an engagement, um, a genuineness and these are a lot of these are words that I don't like as a researcher because I can't define them, although I think mm-hmm. I know I see them. But we know from Zig Engelman, we know we need kids that get explicit instruction. We know they need to be engaged and the teacher has to do that. And they need to get lots of verbal affirmation from teachers. Those things don't happen, though. That's our problem. Um and it's not about being a good or bad teacher. It's just that I don't think we teach people to do those things. Hmm. And because those things happen at such low rates, I mean, we've we've several years ago now published all this data saying we can't predict kid behavior any better than knowing what the teacher does during instruction. There's nothing we have that's better than that. And that's such oh, a wait, wait. Let, let me repeat that. Just 
that's such a key finding. The single biggest predictor that we can use to predict child behavior is the teacher's behavior. Right. So I don't know anything about these kids. You, you throw a random group of kids in a classroom and have me bet on what their behavior will be like. I can watch that teacher for 10 minutes and count things that teacher does. And I can compare those to the norms we built. And I could tell you what the probability is of kids being off task or disruptive based upon teacher's behavior. And, and there's nothing. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Fine. That's, that's better than that. We spend so much time talking about kid behavior. And I think far too little time talking about adult behavior. Hmm. So what are the good behavior? Like what, what, what's it like you said? Okay. So a teacher that's behaving well, uh, I'll put some air quotes around that, um, but it is a teacher that does explicit instruction, that uh, engages students, and that gives them uh, verbal affirmation. So what does that look like? So let's start with being explicit. Being explicit means I've looked at my students. I know who they are. I know where they're from. I know what their interests are. And I will select my examples for whatever I teach based on that. Hmm. The opposite of that is the teachers that just use whatever examples happen to show up in the book, in the curriculum. So my area is thinking about teaching kids behaviors. Well, I want to talk about what should you do when someone's bugging you? What should you do if someone's saying something about you that really frustrates you? Well, I need to go out and find examples that are real about that. And what would happen if you did this at home? And what would happen if, if I just come in and say, Here's Dick and Jane. They're having an argument. Dick should do this. Jane should do that. These kids weren't listening past the first three words. So being, well, they heard they heard Dick, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they did. Um, I have to do something. It's incumbent upon me as a teacher to do something to make them get it and to be interested enough to want to get it. And all of that is part of being explicit. The second part is engaging, which means it can't just be me talking they need to be talking and they need to be doing things. And so I need to, while I'm teaching, be saying, what do you think? Turn to your neighbor and tell them, hey, what if I gave you this? Could you think of three ways to do this? Show me. I need to be engaging them back and forth. It can't just be me saying, you guys sh shut up and listen. I'm going to tell you something. If, if they're not engaged, they're not getting it. And then that third part is once they're doing something, that gives me this opportunity to give them lots of affirmation. However, I could do all three of the things I just described and I could do it while yelling at the kids with a scowl on my face and really dismissing their feelings and I wouldn't get the same effect. Mm -hmm. So there's something else. There's, there's something, something else. else. There's something mm -hmm. else. And that's what sparks me right now is trying to figure out what. I mean, we've got close to 15,000 observations of teachers. We wrote a whole book just on what do teachers and students do in classrooms because we know. We know how much they do. We know when they do it. We know how it varies by gender and ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. All right. How do you know that? Because we code. How? When we go in, we'll code what the teacher does and what the kids do. And we code, we have a code for ethnicity and um I see. So you have, you have a team that's like observing classrooms right. in so a large scale. Observations with a handheld where they're coding everything that happens. Oh, okay. So they're just sitting there and writing it all down. Got it. We do big factor analyses and say, what's the probability of X happening if, if teacher does this? If kid does this and teacher does this, what's the probability of kid being on task five minutes mm -hmm. down? So we can say, we know what things teachers do that, that promote positive things for kids we know what they are and and the things that are give us the biggest bang for our buck are ironically the things that are used the least mm -hmm. well you know not surprisingly right because if if that wasn't the case we wouldn't have the behavior crisis we have today right <laughs> oh, yeah. right i mean so so then are, are you are you then saying that you'll like for example like be able to with a certain reliability, predict student behavior for teachers who do certain things. But if you're looking at teachers who do those things and the model doesn't predict accurately, those are the cases you're looking at now. Like you're saying, well, this teacher's doing the things, but the behavior's not fitting into the model. Um, 
No, we're, it's a little different. What we're doing is saying, let's do the same exact coding we just did on mm -hmm. features, but let's throw in a bunch of other things. Mm. So let's look at, and there's, I think, three steps here, and we're working on step one right now. I'd love to do all three steps, but I can't afford it, and it's too complicated. Step one is, what if we, while we were watching what the teacher does during instruction and what the kid does, pick a kid who has been nominated for challenging behaviors, we put a little wristband on them, and it monitors a ton of biophysical things, so uh, galvanic skin response, respiration, um, heart rate, movement, et cetera. Um, can we predict anything more about what kids do or what teachers do by knowing those things? That'd be phase mm. one. The main thing- so about go phase get more data, basically. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we're doing right now, kind of on a shoestring budget because we don't have federal funding for this yet. Mm -hmm. um, do that, proof of concept, can we do this? Second step is add in voice analysis for teachers. So mm. does a loud voice versus a calm voice predict something different from kids, both mm -hmm. biophysical and their behavior? And then phase three, which... And you could probably use like AI to like get their tone of voice out of a recording, for example, you right? Little, you have a little program that analyzes it and will come back and give you a, like on a frequency grid, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then the, the challenge is to match up that frequency grid with the coding and the, bio with the biometrics right? reading it all across time mm -hmm. uh, and then modeling with it. The third one will be facial recognition. And that exists already. Um, there's a guy who's, I forget how many, 30 or some um personality characteristics or emotions he can identify through facial recognition so if we could put the video camera on a teacher and get that at the same time now you can start piecing together and i don't know what to call it but you can start piecing together teachers that use face number five and voice tone number six have kids that are way more interested than and again, I don't really know what I do with that. Then, though, I try to teach everybody to use this facial expression and this voice tone. But maybe if it's not about intervening, could it at least be about screening? Which, if we had teachers do a practice lesson, could we tell ahead of time which ones were likely to have success with really challenging kids? Hmm. And again, it's all just speculation. This is very exploratory. Totally. Um, but it's 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 what makes me want to go to work every day right now. It's super interesting, and I mean, it, it if you know, there's like in essence, the elusive quality that you're you're measuring is you know attitudes and emotions underlying behavior, right? Because you spend you know two decades observing behavior, now you're trying to get under the tip of the iceberg and see what's going on underneath, right? Well, and you and I have have had this conversation before. I can go into a classroom and look at a teacher and watch them for a while. And, and in my mind, I can say that teacher likes kids or that yeah. teacher wishes they weren't here. And I know that and you can teacher, tell immediately, right? <laughs> I know the kids can do it too. Yeah. But what is it that we're looking at? And, you know, my, my researcher hat makes me want to measure that so that we can mm -hmm. say how much of that is need, needed in order to make this make a difference. I know and, it's and can it be trained, right? And that's a whole nother issue is um, part of my experience in doing this with people in schools is that there are people whose personalities are such that this isn't in their DNA. They're never going to do the way I think they should do it. Um, mm -hmm. Then that's a whole other issue. And, and, and a worrisome issue, uh, especially when, you know, in the context of you know, the current teacher shortages and, you know, they, there's a lot of people in the classroom right now that are new to the profession. Um, and more and more, you know, with the teacher shortages, uh, states are just kind of grasping at possibilities and throwing people in there. Um, I, I worry about that because I really believe there's a science to teaching. Now, maybe these people have the art because I believe there are people out there that have what you need to be a teacher. It's in their personality. But if you don't know 
about being explicit, being engaging, using verbal affirmations, um, it's not going to work either. So somehow we have to find the cross section of people that want to be there and have that gift and people that understand the science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one under helping people understand the science doable, uh, you know, cultivating the gift may be a little harder um, with, with current constraints. I agree that most people I think would say, oh, the art is easy and the science is hard. I think it's the other way around. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, eh, because you know, there's a, uh, like for me, you know, my mission as an educator was always about making school meaningful for students. And, you know, that started with, you know, really engaging curriculum. I built, you know, 180 days of project-based learning and, and all of that. It was super fun. Um, but quickly got to, how do I make this a community for them? Um, and, um, and that's pretty fascinating because like when you think about that as your you know, main focus as a teacher really changes the way that you're approaching every single interaction, but also the like how you're modulating the react, the interactions between students as well. And um, so that really, you know, resonates for me. There's a question here, Terry, um, from uh, one of the participants that says, what about humor? Uh, what's the role of adding in humor in the, in the lesson here? I can't speak to that from a scientific point of view, although there probably is research on that. Um, I use humor with kids all the time. Um, one, it, it gives them, I think, um, an impression of me as someone who is is not there to be me, not there to be harsh, but that I, I enjoy being there. And I think kids are more comfortable when they think the teachers are more comfortable. So I use it all the time, or I try to. Maybe they don't think it's as humorous as I do. <laughs> uh, but I think that's something that I just naturally do, and I feel like it works. And again, I can't say, and the science backs me up on that because I'm not familiar with that science, but I would bet that there's something to it. Mm -hmm. Do you think humor is, like, it's interesting because maybe a humor is the byproduct of that ineffable quality that you're researching, you know, more than a strategy, because you know somebody who's trying too hard to make jokes <laughs> you can tell as well right <laughs> yeah. and it, if i go into a high school classroom where they've never seen me before nothing i say is funny and it's not about them going wow he's really funny it's about them realizing that i'm relaxed and i'm willing to joke around um mm. but they're not that's right they're giving me the stink eye the whole time like who who do you think you are with your and that's fine. I'm still creating a a picture of who I am to them that I'm I I want to enjoy having a conversation with you guys. Hmm. And, and so it works. So if we go back to the research a little bit, I'm curious about like the biometrics and you know what you can get from that. Like let's say we go to your phase one here, like this is what we're most likely to be able to read about, you know, in the upcoming couple of years um, as the research gets published. Um, like what does galvanic skin response have to do with anything? Um, well, it's a measure of perspiration, I guess, is one simple way to think about it. Um, okay. I'll, I'll go back to where it's been used before. A colleague of ours, uh, Alan Alday, um, was using the, the same wristbands with pre-service teachers. And so he was putting the wristband on him, having him watch a video of a classroom. And at some point in that video of the classroom, the kid, a kid, freaks out, throws chairs, curses the teacher, you know, the whole, the whole gamut. Just um, a run of the mill day in a classroom. <laughs> these are teachers gonna be teachers who haven't been in the classroom. And he said everything in their biometrics went berserk. He said there's you know, sweat increased by times four in one second. Um, so you have to think about, again, what's the message the teacher sends to the kids during instruction? Well, if everything in my emotions are going berserk, that's got to be um, obvious to the kids. And what effect might that have on them? Mm. But going back to just pre-service teachers, you know, there's a 
a real logic here for talking about systematic desensitization. But uh, let's let's have these teachers watch lots and lots of kids having misbehaviors before we put them in the school, so that when that does happen, I got this. You know, hey, really? So, Has that been tried? No, that's his next okay. step. All right, oh, yeah. that's interesting. But it, again, so it's like watch, you know. <laughs> 100 hours of videos of this until until the, the galvanic doesn't go up, right, basically. Yeah. Until you cannot make my motor run, and I'm mm. going to be the same caring, genuine person regardless. When you fly out the handle, I'm going to go over and I'm going to say, you doing all right? Why don't you just take a second and get yourself together? Rather than running over there all flustered and getting in their face and being all, you know, everything's going, Mm -hmm. very different probability for that kid outcome you know kids will escalate when adults escalate and i don't think i just mean um emotional escalation where i'm yelling and screaming but just you can look at me and tell i'm breathing fast i am tight i'm hardened and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i also could send a kid up that's a, such an interesting take because you know like there's there's more and more voices um in in education around social emotional learning saying well yes we have all these programs we have these curriculums coming into schools to teach kids social emotional learning so these different skills for you know amongst others self-regulating their emotions and more and more voices saying well how can we expect teachers to do that if we don't teach teachers how to you know for themselves have those skills right like i can't teach karate if i'm not a karate master and um and a lot of those approaches that are, you know, that I'm seeing out there are about teaching teachers these, you know, specific skills and giving them strategies. And it sounds like this is just like, <laughs> make it make it so that it's not a fight or flight situation and you'll be good, you know. Um, so it's kind of a different approach to a problem that I think is being recognized more and more. Um, it's pretty interesting. About those three tenets of effective instruction, explicit engaging feedback those are the tenets of effective instruction regardless of who we're teaching or what we're teaching. So if we're teaching pre-service teachers to deal with kids with severe behaviors, I think the explicit part we can do. But are we engaging with them? Are we having a back and forth where they say, well, what if the kid does this? Well, what if we're this circumstance? And what if we really, and do they have chances to do something with that and get feedback from us? So I don't think we're using effective instruction to teach the adults to do that. We're giving mm. them ideas and then saying, go and go try it. I don't think that's good instruction. So why would we think that they're going to go out there and do it well when we haven't taught it well? Mm. So are you teaching pre-service teachers these days? I do not do that. Um, <laughs> others I was, was going to count, <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> I haven't taught undergrads for years. Um, and that's another one of those things in higher ed. As you go on, you stop doing a lot of that teaching thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is really important yeah it's just the that the, that system works that way it's kind of it has an impact for sure um there's a comment here uh, from somebody saying that they learned how to be good at classroom management by while well, substitute teaching uh while being in college and uh i have to say that's how i started as a teacher i, I substitute taught for a couple of years while i was in college and um, definitely has that same desensitizing <laughs> uh, impact. It's interesting because substitute teaching, you don't have a long-term relationship with these students. Right. It's, I'm here for an hour. If this doesn't work out, you know, you, I'm not going to see them again, you know. I think substitute teaching is the hardest job there is in education. Uh, mm -hmm. That reason. Uh, you know it short-term. They know it short-term. Yep. The fact that someone, the person who uh, made this comment, the fact that he or she or and you could substitute and become a good teacher from it is a testament to who you are as a person. Because That's interesting. a lot of people, that would be the experience that would make them never want to be in a school again. Mm -hmm. And I and I know people that that's the case for sure. <laughs> Um, so, so how's this, how, how fast is this research going to get published? When can we know, um, um, like what's your horizon there? We will start doing the first real data collection this fall. Um, we've been 
trying to get reliable on using the various instruments and syncing them up. We'll, we're hopefully this fall we'll get the first phase and by spring maybe we'll add the voice. I don't think the the uh, video official recognition will be there for years, two, three mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea would be to get enough data to kind of write a concept paper and then to try to get some funding to uh, do mm -hmm. an ex more exploratory studies on a larger scale. It's expensive to do. The, just one of those little wristbands costs thirteen hundred dollars. So, wow, you know, I have two of them. So that means we we have to do dyads and then run to the next dyad. We can't be doing a bunch of things at once. And it means it's mm -hmm. you know, and, and and I guess if we had a bunch of people that really wanted to do this near where I was, I'd buy more of them. But I'm not going to buy more. Just have them sit around because it's it's also not real easy to find a teacher who's willing to put that on and have us come in and watch them every day um mm. oh, yeah, yeah i mean maybe that biases it because it's you you yeah, they'll bias towards confident teachers right absolutely that's a really yeah. good point um yeah we we'll just take what we can get right now mm. and so you know the, there's a um, yeah regardless of this ineffable quality that you're you're still chasing you're like uh it's like moby dick um <laughs> but um you know the a lot of your previous work is super interesting you've written a lot of books about um them do you want to just tell us you know for people who might want to you know know more about this stuff effective instruction you know the um what was it um explicit engage uh feedback model um where, where could somebody read up on that um well, again, the kind of the father of all this is again is Siegfried Engelman, who has now passed away, um, and he wrote about it very technically and created a whole science around it. Um, my interest has always been using that technology for teaching behavior. So mm -hmm. I don't have a background in teaching reading or math, uh, science, any of those things. Uh, my background is in instructional design for behavior. So, um, you know, the book that I wrote called Teaching Behavior was a kind of a first person account of what a teacher does in a classroom um, on a daily basis that involves the tenets of effective instruction as a method for teaching and managing behavior. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. kind of, I put that all together. I'm certainly not the only one or the best one um, when it comes to writing those things. There's, if you look up, classroom management explicit instruction kind of um crossover there's uh, a, a lot of things out there so then what do you think about like prevalent models like pdis and sel and you know mtss these are the behavior you know buzzwords um you know <clears throat> what's your what's your take on i mean i guess those are three separate questions <laughs> but uh what's what's your take on all that on what's happening these days in what? schools I started with PBIS as a doctoral student with George Sagai when they were just starting PBIS. And so I, I've kind of been, been around it from its inception and watched it evolve. Um, I'm a very big believer in PBIS. Um, but PBIS is based on the tenets of effective instruction. Um, the people that developed PBIS at the University of Oregon were all students of Zig Engelman's. And so everything keeps coming back to that. It's just how do you apply it, a logic across the school. So things that the academic oriented people will talk about with big ideas, uh, concepts and scaffolding, all of those have been translated into PBIS. Mm -hmm. We just don't call them the same things. Like we call them expectations the big expectations for your school are the same as big ideas and you know mm -hmm. all those um rules and scaffolding etc that we use in academics become the teaching behaviors that we do so i i'm a big proponent because it's it follows the logic that i follow um i do think that pbas has evolved to the point where it's way past that and, and whether that's good or bad for pbis I don't know, um, but I think that there is logically a, a reason for people to say, we've done PBIS for 25 years, how do we expand it? And so I think mm -hmm. 
people are bringing in lots of other things that are really necessary. And again, will that prove to be too unwieldy and make PBIS become too top heavy and implode and no one can do it? I don't know. Um, but I think it's natural and I think it's necessary to continue to push that. Yeah, totally. Well, and it's interesting because like now I'm, I'm like connecting the dots between some things you said previously, like I've been in, you know, we we help schools, uh, you know, transform and upgrade their PBIS programs. Like that's a lot of the the, the people we work with. And I have seen so many people, um, you know, doing PBIS, but not in a benevolent way. Um you know, going back to, you can do all those things, but you're still yelling at the kids. You know, yeah. I've seen people, you know, you put in the tokens and it's meant to be, you know, positive affirmations, but people are, you know, we've seen types of people use them to, you know, hey, you won't like threaten that they won't get their dollars. And, you know, basically like, you know, use the currency as a way to really not do positive affirmation. Um, so there's, I think there's, there's, you know, some of the ineffable qualities of what you're looking around, um, effective instruction and in classroom management translate to the school level as well. And maybe it's like school culture or, or, or some broad term like that. But, but I, I kind of feel like there's, there's some of that happening too. I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah, I do. And the other thing that's really exploding in our field, uh, is the need for mental health mm -hmm. and, you mentioned SEL earlier, and I think it mental health falls under there. Um, it is becoming more and more of a major issue in schools with little kids, too. I mean, preschool. Kids. Yeah. Um, COVID certainly has um, exacerbated the problem. Um, but more and more, it's clear that what we may, may have thought of as the role of a school won't be sufficient for a lot of kids. And, mm. you know, even in today's political climate, I've heard people just recently saying schools are there to teach reading, writing, arithmetic. That would be great if that were what, what it took, but it's so much more. And if mm -hmm. we say well, that's not our business, then the reading, writing, arithmetic isn't going to work either. So Agreed. we have to be able to see the whole kid and work with the whole kid. And when kids come in with um, mental health deficiencies and some real issues, if we don't deal with that, number one, school's not going to work. And number two, their whole life isn't going to work. It's just a really scary proposition to think that we'd be backing off of any of those things rather than doubling down. But then what about like there's no time? there's if you don't do i mean it, that's what i hear that you know like but yeah but we have to get through the curriculum what are we getting like there's no time for this but you're not getting through the curriculum because i agree right so, i mean um wh whatever it takes to make kids successful is what we have to be doing i mean that's that's the job um Wait, let, let me pause and, and quote you right there we need to do whatever it takes to make these kids <laughs> successful that is the job i love that but but nobody, I hope, nobody said being a teacher will just be a super cushy job. You have a lot of responsibility to if you're doing it well. And there are a lot of tasks involved with thinking through what's going to make this work for these kids. Mm. Uh, I had someone once in a school, a teacher, say to me, you know, my job is to teach the subject. That's it. And I, I didn't say this. But I thought, then you're probably not a very good teacher, because if that's all you're doing, we could hire a robot to go in there and read out of the book to the kids. That's not what does it. There's something else that we have to have adults doing to make this work. And I, I believe that there is are things we could do with machine learning, but it's not going to replace having a relationship and giving real examples to kids and talking about what that means for their world. Well, not at, least, not at least until robots are far more sophisticated than they are now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, society will have imploded before we have those robots, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, I I so agree with that. I mean, you know, our tagline at Classcraft is relationships are everything. And, 
you know, we're, we're using gamification models for, you know, motivating students around behavior. And, and so much of the time, you know, we have exchanges about, you know, gamifying uh, math and gamifying reading and like the, like all the curricular side of this. And, you know, my experience has been that if the kids don't want to be there, all of that doesn't matter. And, and that, you know, that includes, I don't want to be there because I have mental health challenges. That includes, I don't want to be here because it's not safe. That includes, I don't want to be here because my teacher doesn't like me, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and so like, a, I, I, I think that there's a responsibility we have to make it a place kids want to be. Um, and, and that, and that does mean, you know, what you're saying, uh, helping them address mental health challenges. And it's sad that that's where we are, but it is where we are. Um, is it sad? Why is that sad? It's, it's sad that these things aren't handled by other areas of our society, that mental health isn't available to people who need it, that the only place they're going to get it is in the school. Uh, that's sad that it falls upon the school to do that. Um, sure. But it is the reality. And so if we choose not to do it, because we don't have time, all we're going to do is have more problems. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just think, again, a a more civilized society maybe would, would figure out ways to make sure that everybody's getting what they need rather than beating up the school to figure it out mm. you think we're going to get it probably not before i retire <laughs> <laughs> you're you're still only a, you're not a day above 20 man terry <laughs> um you know some some of the questions i had prepared here were about you know what are big challenges what do you foresee and and i feel like we addressed some of these but maybe you know one last one here could be um what advice would you have for teachers that are starting their careers today? There's a lot of people um, that are have left the profession and as a result, lots of people coming to the profession. Mm -hmm. um, what would be your advice to them today? Um, focus on practices and relationships. Constantly take your temperature on these things mentally and engage in continuous improvement. I mean, we're never we're never done learning how to be better teachers. I I feel like every time I'm back in a classroom doing something with the kids, I think, God, why didn't I do that? That was totally wrong. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm trying to take my temperature constantly and think, what, what would I do next time with that? Um, we just have to remember that what we do when we're with our students has a major impact on the probability of their success. And, and that is a responsibility for us. I mean, the fact that we have such an impact, along with that comes giant responsibility. And so um, I, I feel like, um, well, being a teacher wasn't what I wanted to do when I was in high school or even in college. Um, the more I've been a teacher and studied teaching, the more I have realized what, what an incredible difference teachers have the ability to make. And that that responsibility makes me feel like I need to keep doing things and keep learning. And I think that's the way everyone should approach it is that I'm not a master teacher. I'm a teacher who's been doing this a long time, who knows a lot, but I want to be better. It's so interesting. I mean, I think that a lot of teachers feel like they can't have an impact anymore. Um, yes, every day. I I believe that. Um, but, you know, I think uh, it's a challenging job in people you know, lose sight of that. Um, so those are the time important that, words. It's an important um, reminder. When I worked in residential treatment, you know, these kids would be wards of the state. They'd be placed there. They'd be there for a year or so, and then they'd be moved on to some other placement. And you didn't think about it, really didn't see them much. But every once in a while, you'd see one, and they'd come up and say, thanks. And I'd say, for doing what? I mean, you, you really failed when you were there. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, but you always treated me with respect. And uh, I feel like 
that's that really means a lot to me um that it, that it didn't make a difference then but if you feel that now maybe it did make a difference but it keeps it keeps me grounded in thinking it, it's not magic i don't have any magic skills with kids but i know the kinds of things that work and i go back to practices and relationships mm. i uh you know i think it's important to remember that in these times where you know there's um more behavioral challenges than ever in the classroom um, and where, you know, the social climate is super challenging for teachers. Important, I think, for them to remember why they got into teaching and knowing that, you know, they can have an impact on a person or people, you know, on a regular basis. So thanks for those words, Terry. Uh, we're coming up on, on time here. Thank you so much uh, for, for this exchange. Um, as always, uh, every conversation I have with you, I find uh, super fascinating and interesting. So thank you so much for your time. I'm and sure everybody much. listening felt the same way. Well, again, I appreciate it being involved with you and, and your organization. And, you know, um, I think it's worthwhile. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. And I really look forward to you know, hearing more about, you know, the, the ineffable quality, if we can find it. Um, you know, I think that will uh, be super fascinating. So thanks again. Uh, good luck with your back to school season in grant writing. And for everybody listening, good luck with your back to school. And I hope that this uh, inspired you and informed you. And um, you can find out more about all this work we're doing on classcraft.com or on our social media. Um, there's more of these talks as well. So feel free to, um, you know, join in on the next ones or uh, go listen to the recordings of the previous ones. Thank you so much. Thank you.